This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. This is an odd topic to cover just days before Christmas, the second holiest day of the year for Catholics after Easter Sunday. But many are now openly speculating that Francis is trying to not reform the Catholic Church, but to ready the paths for the man of sin himself. That's an extraordinary thing to see people claiming, and I caution people from being ready to believe it fully, because if you are wrong in that assessment, then you make yourself vulnerable to being fooled by the man of sin and his prophet when they do truly arrive on the scene. It's why I caution people from internet mystics and internet priestly prophets who would provide concrete timelines for the fulfillment of approved Catholic prophecy. For when they're inevitably wrong, and they always are, they lead people astray, even if they're well-meaning individuals who truly believe the things that they say. But the claim here that I'm going to present is worth carefully looking at. My contention is that Francis was questionably placed at best on the Sea of Peter, that he appears to occupy the most important office in the world, and is probably the worst example of a supposed pontiff in the whole history of the Church. But is he the false prophet of Catholic prophecy? I'm not so sure. But let's take a look at the chatter anyway, because a lot of this stuff is coming out right now, and people are sending me all this stuff, and I think a lot of you would find this interesting. But, as always, be cautious about diving into any of this subject matter. This story is going to seem strange to many. There are some claiming Francis is the false prophet of the Book of the Apocalypse of St. John, what Protestants and modernists call the Book of Revelation. Yes, before the 1960s, every Catholic Bible called it the Apocalypse. <laughs> you may not have known that. Now, this story is something many of you have asked about, at least topically, so let's take a look at the basic claim. Is Francis the forerunner of the Antichrist? Only our Lord knows for sure, but some have pointed to some basic things that may point to that. I don't know for sure, but the man of sin's false prophet will do one thing. He will build an ape of the church for the man of sin, who will then attempt to bury the faith and trick the faithful into falling onto their knees and worshiping him. That's right out of the book of the Apocalypse. But what would that require? Undermining the faith and worship due to our blessed Lord and the Father above, and putting the church in service to the world. This is a question asked recently in a well-traveled European Catholic news site who offered us this take, and I've got links to this and everything else in my show notes at returntotradition.org. That's the name of this podcast with a .org at the end. Just look for the post with this video's title in it, and you'll see all my sources there, and you can go read this for yourself. Headline. Bergoglio is not the Antichrist, but the false prophet who precedes him. You recognize him from his works. Now, that's a rather unambiguous opinion. Let's see what the author actually says. Quote, Bergoglio, the one who changed the words of our Father. Bergoglio, the one who changed the words of the Gloria. Bergoglio, the one who does not kneel before the Blessed Sacrament, except that one time only to be reprimanded and thus demonstrate the opposite. Bergoglio, who wants to change the words of the consecration, thus distorting the centrality of the Eucharist. Bergoglio, who affirms that Jesus made himself devil, contradicting the Catholic doctrine according to which the Son of God became man to, re to redeem men. Bergoglio, who considers the Holy Cross a sign of defeat and not of salvation, the Lamb slain for us on the cross to overcome evil. Bergoglio, the man who saves Judas by canceling the existence of hell. End quote. And he goes on and on like that. Now, for those in America, it's a long-standing tradi European tradition to refer to the Pope by his birth name, and it's not a sign of disrespect. That sounds strange to American ears, but I've seen appropriately respectful references to Pope Pius XII in old newspapers that called him Pope Pacelli. So I can assure you that it's not a disrespectful thing that they do when they call him by his birth name. For those who don't think Francis is Pope, it probably doesn't matter to you either way, but the things the author is saying here are actually true. Francis has said and done all those things and signaled that he wants to do more. Here's one example. Anne Barnhart is reporting that Archbishop Arthur Roach and company are working on behalf of Francis to change the words of consecration in the Novus Ordo Mass, which would almost and certainly invalidate the sacrifice. Few details are known at this time, but it is reminiscent of what had happened historically. After the release of the man-made Mass of Paul VI, the translation of the words of consecration in much of the West, including in the U.S. and Germany, said the sacrifice on the cross was for all, as opposed to for many. It may seem like a minor distinction, but it caused quite the stir and for decades was left in place, leading many leading theologians to believe, with good reason, that the Eucharist at the new Mass was rarely, if ever, confected in the first place. 
It's a complicated issue and not one worth going into here, but there is a serious theology behind why the sacrifice on the cross was not for all, but for many, having to do with free will and our accepting of the gift of the grace of faith, and including the fact that not everyone will be saved. The modernists love them some universal salvation, with the most famous examples being statements from theologians and celebrity bishops that dare we hope all men are saved. That may well return if we're not vigilant. The other half of that story is the obvious one. Miss Barnhart is also reporting that any priest of the FSSP or similar groups who try to join the SSPX and get accepted by the Society of St. Pius X will get excommunicated by Francis and his merry band of modernists. That's to be accepted, and, and one wonders how many will buy those excommunications as valid when it happens, because they won't be valid. Father Ripperger has even said in the past that such excommunications are invalid, and he is no fan of the SSPX. But the project of building the ape of the church from Catholic prophecy marches on. An essential part of this making it appear that the Catholic church has become the plaything of the secular powers that be, putting the name of the church and her institutions at the service of wicked men who just don't have the faith. Francis just took a big step towards accomplishing that goal with his document for Telly Tutti on Universal Brotherhood, and now he's taking a next big step. Headline from the very pro-Francis National Catholic Reporter. Pope establishes Fratelli Tutti Foundation. Now, if you don't remember Fratelli Tutti, the central theme of the document was to build the universal brotherhood of all mankind. Ostensibly, it's to promote peace, which is a fine goal in and of itself, but part of doing that involved just ignoring basic Catholic truths in favor of the values of Caesar and the Leviathan, the values of the world, thus helping to make the church of the man of sin closer to reality, the universal church of man. The article does a fine job of enumerating what this whole mess is about. Quote, Pope Francis established a new Vatican foundation that will promote initiatives based on the principles set out in his encyclical Fratelli Tutti on fraternity and social friendship. In a decree published by the Vatican December 15th, the Pope said he would gladly accede to the request of the Fabrica di San Pietro, the Vatican office charged with the maintenance and upkeep of St. Peter's Basilica, to establish a foundation of religion and worship intended to collaborate in spreading the principles set forth in his encyclical. The Fratelli Tutti Foundation, he said, will encourage initiatives linked to spirituality, art, education, and dialogue with the world, around St. Peter's Basilica and in the embrace of its colonnade. The, de de the decree, also known as the Chirograph, was signed by the Pope December 8th. According to its statutes, the foundation, which will be headed by Cardinal Mauro Gambetti, Archpriest of St. Peter's Basilica, will support and plan the promotion of art and faith. It will also invest in cultural and spiritual formation through events, experiences, paths, and spiritual exercises, and promote dialogue with cultures and other religions on the themes of the Pope's recent encyclical to build a social alliance. Among the goals of the Fratelli Tutti Foundation will be to promote a culture of peace, as well as new encounters that are nourished by social dialogue, the sense of social forgiveness. It will also sponsor initiatives that foster the development of fraternal humanism, aimed at promoting the principles of freedom, equality, and fraternity, conditions for building a universal love that recognizes and protects the dignity of persons, etc. Lastly, inspired by the social teaching of the Catholic Church, the new foundation will promote social alliance, responsible entrepreneurship, social investment, human and sustainable forms of work, as well as integral ecology, stable development, ecological transition, health and scientific and technological research, end quote. What any of that has to do with the Catholic faith is beyond my comprehension. Some argue in the defense of these moves that this is simply the work of continuing the church's great history and tradition of providing a social teaching to the world. The problem here is this. Francis's contributions through Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti to that body of work bear no resemblance to Catholic social teaching. They invert the proposed values of the church's social message. Classically, from Leo XIII through Pius XII, the Church taught that families and local communities were where the majority of economic and social power should be, and that private property was nearly sacred, and then the various pontiffs would craft their social proposals around those central values. After the Council, that changed, with the popes embracing the Leviathan that emerged after the war with an ever-increasing gusto with each passing pontificate, that Francis now has the institutions of the Church at the service of the Leviathan, with extremely questionable United Nations conferences being hosted by the Vatican, and few if any prelates asking how we got here. Francis's contributions to this body of work is an inversion that puts families and local communities at the bottom of the ladder of importance. Placing the church at the service of the world is the key here. It's a form of diabolic inversion. 
If you're not familiar with what diabolic inversion is, but most simply it's the taking of things for the purpose of Christ and putting them into the service of the devil by flipping their purpose. It's sort of a taking our values and making a parody of them. The placing of the church at the service of the secular world in order to promote their programs is the easiest example of this. In a right-ordered world, the church and secular powers work together to create a society that makes the salvation of souls much easier. And the salvation of souls is the highest law of the church and its principal aim. Recalling that the lord of the world is the devil, what we see is the would-be Caesars and Leviathans work to make the salvation of all souls all the harder. Whatever they overtly realize it or not, to put the church at the service of that effort is made possible by the diabolic disorientation that entered the church, according to Sister Lucia. It's no small thing, and something the prophet of the man of sin would certainly try to do. But does that make Francis his prophet? No. Frankly, I expect Francis' successor in the next few years to actually be far worse than him. Why? Aside from his manipulation of the logistics of the conclave, it is obvious that things are going to get worse before they get any better, and that even the best of the bishops are turning against the traditional faith. See Cardinals Mueller and Seurat's recent statements about Traditionis Custodis and the Mass, for example, or how most of the bishops have been enablers of the evil actions of the various would-be Caesars and Neros of the world in the past couple of years, by denying people access to the Mass for failing to submit themselves to the evil decrees of the rulers of the world. Those bishops are just as fallen as Francis. We're just more aware of his errors due to the office he appears to hold and his love of being in front of cameras. I could go on and on with this, but instead I'll wrap up with this basic message. Be wary of those who would either try to get us to voluntarily deny ourselves access to traditional sacraments from traditional priests, and be wary of those who propose timelines for the fulfillment of the signs of the ends of times. Our Lord told us not to speculate on the timetables too much, because no one knows the hour or the day. So refrain from doing that. I expect to have another We Were Warned series entry in the coming days, and it will, as always, be free of such speculations, because how spiritually hazardous they are. Be wary, folks. Always be wary. Let me know what you think of this in the comments, please. Would Francis changing the words of consecration in the new Mass be enough for those on the fence about him to realize what he is? Let me know what you think about this. And as always, pray for the Church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.